Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome. My name is Ariel Feldman. I'm a professor of Jewish studies at Bright Divinity School and Texas Christian University. Warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. For many of us, the last 12 days were among the most traumatic times we've ever experienced. We hope that today's event will offer an opportunity to take our minds off the news, even if for a short while. It is my pleasure to welcome today to Bright and TCU, Professor Brian Ogren of Rice University in Houston. Professor Ogren is a renowned scholar of Jewish mystical traditions, especially of the esoteric lore known as Kabbalah. He traveled the world to study and research Jewish mysticism and Jewish mystics. Florence, Jerusalem, Harvard, uh, some of those places where he studied and conducted his research. His many articles deal with such exciting figures as uh, figures of Renaissance, such as Giovanni Pico de Ramirandola, Moses Mendelssohn of early modernity, and Don Isaac Avravanel. His books explore such topics as the belief in reincarnation in Kabbalah, Kabbalistic visions of creation, and the influences of Kabbalah on thinkers and theologians in early American history. In fact, the very title of today's lecture, Kabbalah in the Founding of America, is the title of his most recent book, published in 2021. As we're all welcoming Dr. Ogren, I remind you that you're welcome to post your questions and comments and Q&A box, as well as in the chat. Uh, Vanessa Daly and I will try to monitor those to the best of our abilities. And at the end, we will present at least some of your questions, depending on the time, uh, to our speaker to respond to them. But otherwise, the floor is all yours, Dr. Ogren. Uh, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much. I want to thank Professor Feldman for inviting me to talk to you today. And I must say it's both an honor and a pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to share my research and to make the connection with your esteemed pluralist institution. In fact, I was very impressed to read about the truly ecumenical nature of your programming and beyond that, your international character and your fostering of interfaith dialogue as really as is evidenced by your very own Jewish studies program. And this idea of interfaith dialogue, I just want to add, is so important, especially in light of our times, in light of what's going on with world events, in light of even just some of the isolationist tendencies around the globe, it couldn't be more important to foster this idea that we need to really talk to each other and we really need to try to understand each other. So as you can see, uh, in that vein of interfaith dialogue, I wanna talk to you today about an unprecedented model of a famed 18th century revolutionary era American intellectual leader and congregational minister. And as uh, Professor Feldman was mentioning, this is part of my recent book on Kabbalah and the founding of America. You can see here the tagline, though, for this talk is about interfaith dialogue and comparative uh, mysticism. And this minister that I'm referring to is, let me see, can you all see this? This is Ezra Stiles. Um, this Ezra Stiles was of Newport, Rhode Island. He's pictured here, as you can see, in the now famous portrait that hangs in the art gallery of Yale University. Stiles spent several years at the very success as a as a very successful minister of the Second Congregational Church in Newport, Rhode Island, which is pictured here. Uh, it was a Calvinist congregation that met in the Clark Street Meeting House, which you can see on the right here is still standing and is now part of the National Register of Historic Places. Stiles was a man of letters who was in close contact with the likes of John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. He played a major role in the establishment of Brown University 
and he went on to serve as the seventh president of Yale starting in 1778, and he was there until his death in 1795. So he was a very, very important intellectual figure in early American history. And for the purposes of my talk on interfaith dialogue today, it is highly important to note that Stiles was extremely interested in Judaism and in Jewish learning. At Yale, he made Hebrew a, a required course in the freshman curriculum. This was the first time that this had happened. And in his first commencement address, which incidentally was originally written in Hebrew, he advocated for rabbinic learning in all of the colleges of America. Remember, this is a Protestant minister who's making this claim. Yet even before arriving at Yale, Stiles was interested in Jewish learning since he saw it as the foundation, the fundamental root of what he considered to be original and authentic apostolic Christianity. For that reason, already as a minister in Newport, he would regularly visit the Turo Synagogue, which we have a picture of the inside here. Uh, it is also standing as a National Historic Site, and just as an aside, it's the oldest synagogue building in the United States. So if you ever get a chance, you can go visit it, like I did here. Um, and you can see that what I'm holding up here in this picture, he left behind his own drawing of the Torah Ark from his own visits. And if my wife hadn't been such a bad picture, taken such a bad picture, uh, in which you can see here the tour guide is central and blocking the view of the ark and it's all out of frame, then you would see me here holding up Styles' image uh, in front of the actual object. That was the idea here. But this is the only image I got of it. In any case, aside from regularly attending synagogue services and eventually befriending members of Newport's Jewish community, Stiles became deeply interested in Jewish mysticism. And around the same time that he began devoting himself, uh, this was around the same time that he began devoting himself to the study of the Hebrew language. Uh, this was in the 1760s and then onward and really for the rest of his life. Known by Stiles as some of his, and some of his predecessors as Kabbalah, or literally that which is received, Stiles saw what he perceived to be the entirety of the Jewish mystical tradition as going back to Moses at Sinai, and then leading into and through the Second Temple period. So for Stiles, this made Kabbalah a tool by which to better understand the connection between the Torah of Moses, as understood by Judaism, and Jesus and the early church as the pinnacle of revelation in his mind, which he thought should be emulated by American Protestantism. To this end, in December of 1769, he turned to his friend Benjamin Franklin, maybe some, some of you have heard of this figure, Benjamin Franklin, who Franklin was living in London at the time as a colonial representative. And Stiles wrote a letter to Franklin asking whether he could procure for Stiles a copy of the Zohar, which is a central, Kabbalist, a central text of Kabbalistic lore. And we have a, an image here. It's unclear whether it was ultimately Franklin who acquired the Zohar for Stiles, as he had originally asked, but we do know that in 1772, Stiles received a copy of the 1684 Sultzbach edition of the Zohar, and this is the frontispiece of which is, which is uh, pictured here. This is not actually Stiles' own copy of the Zohar, which unfortunately is lost, I say unfortunately, because we have reports that it had his own notes all along in the margins, um, but somehow it went missing. But this is another copy of the same edition. Stiles set to work studying the Zohar immediately after he received it in 1772. And then less than two weeks later, he embarked on one of what I believe is the most fascinating interfaith dialogical exchanges in early American history. 
This exchange, which will be the focus of the remainder of my talk today, began on November 9th, 1772, and it involved a certain Jewish emissary from Europe named Moshe Bar David. In his diary entry of that day, Stiles describes Rabbi Moshe as, and I'm quoting him here, an Ashkenazin of Little Poland of the Holy Synagogue of Apta. So that is, he was an Eastern European Jew from Apatow, Poland, which is a town between Krakow and Lublin uh, that had a vibrant Jewish community in the 18th century and a famous synagogue, which is pictured here, that soon became a hub of Hasidic activity. Unfortunately, the synagogue was destroyed by the Nazis in World War II, but we do have some images of it, like the one that we have here. According to Stiles, his new acquaintance from this synagogue that we see here, Rabbi Moshe Bar David, who was now on the American continent, was 52 years old. He was well-traveled. He was learned in the Talmud and the Zohar. This is uh, according to Stiles' report. And he was, and I'm here I'm quoting Stiles, he says he was well acquainted with the rabbins of the Middle Ages, as Maimonides, a figure we're going to come back to in a minute, Yarchi and the Kimchis and others. So these are various Jewish philosophers and commentators uh, who are very important to the Jewish textual tradition. Stiles writes that Rabbi Moshe, this Rabbi Moshe Bar David, he was a self-professed gaon, which literally means a genius. And importantly, he came bearing a letter of testimony from the rabbi of the Portuguese synagogue in London. So he had a reputable individual who was attesting to his credentials. Remember, this is before you could just Google somebody and find out what their background is. So carrying a letter from the rabbi of the Portuguese synagogue of London was very important in this regard. But beyond what is reported by Stiles, nothing is known about this seemingly erudite figure. We have no records from the rabbi himself. Uh, and his name, I should mention, Moshe Bar David, literally Moses, the son of David, is quite mythical and messianic in and of itself. Uh, and one colleague suggested to me that perhaps this is even somehow a made-up character. I don't think so, but it's very interesting in, nonetheless. Rabbi Moshe was the second of a total of six rabbis with whom Ezra Stiles purportedly met. And while he has been widely overlooked by scholarship, it's my contention that he was perhaps the most important rabbi to Stiles' development in Jewish learning, uh, and he can be held up as a paragon of interfaith exchange. Uh, now, we can discuss, I don't want to get too anachronistic here. Um, I'm not saying it's the same idea of pluralism that we hold contemporaneously com right now. However, it does at offer some type of precedent for this type of interfaith exchange. And in fact, unlike all of the other rabbis with whom Stiles talked and whom he encountered, Rabbi Moshe gifted Stiles with a Hebrew text from the Kabbalistic tradition. And with Rabbi Moshe, we have the first known instance of real-time interreligious learning on the North American continent. In fact, I like to refer to their exchange as one of the first known truly interreligious Havruta stu uh, studies, perhaps anywhere, but certainly in North America. Havruta, for those who may not know, is an Aramaic word that means fellowship, or more literally, friendship. And it is a traditional rabbinic approach to Jewish text study which involves at least two individuals, we can see as pictured here, for example. Uh, these, and these individuals discuss and they debate a shared text in true partnership, at least that's the ideal. 
the debate can become heated. And the idea is that meaning making happens through live dialogue, even which even if it is heated and divergent, this leads to camaraderie and to insight for both partners. The idea is that meaning making happens in between, in the dialogue between the two partners. Uh, and in between the dialogue between the two partners and also between the two partners and the text. Like the Kabbalah that Stiles sought to interrogate, Chavruta offered an old new approach, I would say, that perhaps inadvertently offered an ancient reformulated paradigm for greater understanding. On the very day that the two figures met in November of 1772, Rabbi Moshe called upon Stiles for an afternoon visit. At the time, Stiles reports, and this is in his diary. Hopefully you can see this here. I showed him the Zohar, with which he was much delighted, speaking with raptures of sublimity and mysteries of its contents. He told me if I could comprehend that book, I should be a master of Jewish learning and of the greatest philosophy in the world. Hyperbolic, perhaps, although certainly it's giving an impression of what this figure, Rabbi Moshe Bar David, felt about Kabbalah and about the Zohar specifically. As I previously mentioned, Stiles had received his copy of the Zohar less than two, two weeks prior to this, but now he had a chance to bring his study of that text from solitary deliberation with a learned Jewish rabbi. Uh, so uh, he was reading, reading and deliberating with this rabbi in a Hevruta type study. In an astonishing turn of events, Kabbalistic study brought a prominent early American congregational minister who really was the, one of the, and I can't emphasize this enough, he was one of the founders of some of our greatest intellectual in, uh, institutions and trajectories. Uh, and this congregational minister was in direct educational discussion with an official learned representative of the Jewish community coming over from Europe. What is more, Rabbi Moshe offered Stiles full legitimation for his sentiment that the Zohar is a great repository of learning and sublime philosophy. So from, from Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, and until Rabbi Moshe, there's this sense of continuity of the greatness of this text for an understanding of the philosophy behind philosophy, so to speak. Now it bears mention that Stiles' diary was published in 1901 we have a picture of it here by the Yale librarian Franklin Bowditch Dexter. And it's an extremely useful tool, I must say, but there are some extraordinary passages in Stiles' diary regarding his, specifically in this case, regarding his exchanges with Moshe Bar David, but also other instances as well, that have peculiarly been omitted from the 1901 printed edition. And several scholars have relied upon the printed version. And in fact, I believe that these omissions may be the reason why the interreligious relationship between Stiles and Rabbi Moshe has not gotten its fair due. But nevertheless, those passages are readily available in the Stiles papers at the Beinecke Library at Yale. So we do have access to them, and I was able to look through them, and I was able to find some very, very interesting pieces of early American history. And it's just one of those entries with an accompanying diagram in the diary that I want to focus on today in order to flesh out the interreligious Chavruta study between Stiles and Moshe. In the continuation of his description of the Zoharic discussion with Rabbi 
Moshe Bar David. Stiles writes, and I'm quoting him here, he explained several passages in it, in the Zohar, he's talking about here, respecting the holy name, the name of God, right? And the ten Safirots, he calls them. Of the Safirots, he spoke with eyes turned he up heavenward and with fervor. He said Rabbi Moses ben Maimon had written upon nine of the Gilgalim, or circles, but not on the tenth, which he left as too deep and mysterious. Now here the idea of the Safirot, or properly pronounced Sefirot, is that of divine uh, ten divine hypostases. Some of you may have heard of this. If not, I just want to go over briefly. There's this idea of ten divine hypostases, uh, which the Zo in Zoharic Kabbalah represent the theosophical structure of the Godhead. So for purposes of explanation, and I realize we're getting a little bit into the weeds here, we can think of these as parallel to the Trinitarian idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or, if you will, the Neoplatonic idea of the soul, the intellect, and the one, as three that are sharing an underlying substance, and as man manifesting a fundamental reality that supports all of existence and all of everything. For Kabbalah, these are ten in one. They're ten, but they are one. Again, like the Christian Trinity, uh, just for purposes of uh, parallel of understanding here. The, right, the Christian Trinity is three in one and one in three. Here, there's ten in one and one in ten, and all are emanated from out of each other. And in that case, it's like the Neoplatonic triad, which all emanates from the one. Um, so from this depiction uh, that we see here in this image that I have on the screen, uh, this is from, incidentally, this is from the Zoltzbach edition of the Zohar, and thus this would have been directly in front of the eyes of Stiles during his conversation with Rabbi Moshe. And here, the hypostatic sefirot are represented by 10 different Hebrew divine names that appear throughout the Bible. So the idea is that all of these different divine names represent different archetypes of the divine, yet they're all conjoined into one again. What's quite stunning here is that Rabbi Moshe Bar David references Maimonides, the famed 12th century Jewish rationalist, legalist, and Aristotelian philosopher. And he's taking Maimonides, this famed philosopher, and he's placing him within the context of Kabbalistic explanation. Very bizarre. Maimonides was not a Kabbalist, although he was made into one, as we're going to see by later generations, by other, those who came after, who cast him as a Kabbalist, including, I would argue here, certainly uh, Moshe Bar David, this figure who's in dialogue with Ezra Stiles. In invoking Moshe, Moses ben Maimon, and, and I'm quoting him here, right? He, he, as he had in the previous slide, let's see if I can go up here, right? Uh, Moses ben Maimon, he's talking about upon the nine Gilgalim or circles, but not on the tenth. You can see it here. He is referring both to Maimonides' uh, work entitled Hilchot Yesodea Torah, which really briefly is his treatise, Maimonides' treatise on the laws of the foundations of the Torah, and also to Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed, his famous Aristotelian philosophical treatise. In the former, the Hilchot Yisodei Torah, where we can see a quote here, Maimonides states that the spheres, or Galgalim, are called heavens, firmament, celestial abode, and the celestial planes, and there are nine spheres. And then he proceeds to name these nine according to the designation of their heavenly bodies. 
In his Guide of the Perplexed, by contrast, Maimonides discusses these nine celestial spheres in light of the Aristotelian idea of separate intellects or intelligences, as we can see here, a representation uh, which talks about the first, second, third, so on, intelligences until the tenth. Uh, and these really command or rule over their different spheres. And in a passage that's too, we've already started to get into the weeds here, so there's a passage that's a little bit too complicated to get into. Uh, Maimonides, and it, it might also be a little um, boring to unpack, but Maimonides intimates, I'll just state, that there is a series of 10 emanating separate intellects, as we see here, intelligences, nine of which are linked to their own celestial spheres, which they move. In this diagram, that would uh, be the 10th, which, which moves the Earth, the ninth, which moves the moon, the eighth, which moves Mercury, the seventh, which moves Venus, the sixth, which moves the sun, the fifth, which moves Mars, the fourth, which moves Jupiter, the third, which moves Saturn, and the second, which moves the fixed stars. There's an idea that there was a um, realm, the rakia, the firmament that contained and held the fixed stars stars. And for Maimonides, the first intelligence behind the second is the active intellect. And this is a, an entity that emanates directly from the unmoved mover or God, which relates to the divine sphere that brings into actuality all of existence. Again, this is quite a complicated pre-Copernican, I should note, this is a pre-Copernican cosmological view of the universe that sees our earth at the center and layers of concentric circles enclosed like the membranes of an onion. Again, this is not specific to Maimonides. Other philosophers, other scientists of the day also held similar ideas and similar patterns. However, Maimonides is placing it in within a Hebrew context here. But it sh I should note that there's absolutely nothing Kabbalistic about the Maimonidean dis discourse on the spheres. But in bringing this forth for Ezra Stiles in uh, relation to the divine hypostases known as the Sefirot, Rabbi Moshe Bar David is following a fairly long line of tradition in converting Maimonides, the rationalist, into a mystical Kabbalist. For him, there are 10 spheres in, the, in Maimonidean thought, which of course parallel the 10 sefirot of the Zohar and of other Kabbalistic sources. Maimonides discusses only nine because the 10th is entirely unknowable. It's in the realm of the unmoved mover. It's in the infinite realm of God. Um, right, it's the transcendent versus the imminent element within God. For Moshe Bar David, this is parallel to the Sifirot, which sometimes get cast in concentric circles, as the diagram we see here with the highest or outest, out, most outer level, the highest sefira, being virtually in, indistinguishable from the apophatic realm of that which is known as Ein Sof, the infinite, the ungraspable aspect of God, the apophatic, that which is beyond all saying. It can't be said because it's beyond speech. It's beyond all comprehension. Maimonides allows Rabbi Moshe Bar David to bridge uh, for his erudite Protestant American inter interlocutor between philosophy and religion, and also unwitt unwittingly between pre Copernican cosmology and a more modernist sense of hypostatic mysticism. But perhaps more pertinent than the Maimonidean reading of Kabbalah to our discussion today, which I realize we got a little bit into the weeds with the philosophic lingo, uh, when we talk about interreligious 
dialogue and interreligious bridging, there's an interesting continuation of Stiles' account of his conversation with the rabbi from Apta of Little Poland. In his diary, and we can see here another diagram with circles, in his diary, Stiles goes on to explain. He says that the rabbi said, Rabbi Moshe Bar David, that the ten galgalim were circles upon which I showed him the circles of the celestial hierarchy of Dionysius the Areopagite. Now, fortunately, the diagram mentioned is preserved in Stiles' notebooks. And fortunately, I was able to find it on a page that for some unknown reason was misdated to July 14th, 1792. And in a novel move of what I would call comparative mysticisms here, coming back to the title or the subtitle of my talk for today, Stiles is using the late 5th or early 6th century Christian Neoplatonist Dionysius the Areopagite in order to discourse with the rabbi concerning the Holy Sephirot as philosophically classed, cast in a Maimonidean Aristotelian key, as we saw. As we can see here, uh, his diagram hierarchically radiates outward with the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter Hebrew name of God in the center. And then we have Seraphim, Cherubim, and the thrones progressively extending outwards. This is a uh, names for different uh, hosts of angels. Um, and then we have a further hierarchy of tri a, tri a hierarchical triad of powers, dominions, and virtues. And then finally, a triad at the bottom of the overall hierarchy of principalities, of archangels, and of angels. So, as we can see here, this is indeed the hierarchical schema of nine orders of angels surrounding the ineffable God, as outlined by Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, which Styles is explicitly using here to make sense of the Kabbalistic system of the ten Sephirot. And Dionysius writes in his famed work, The Celestial Hierarchy, uh, he writes, Theology has given to the celestial beings nine interpretive names in three threefold orders. In the first rank, the most holy thrones and cherubim and seraphim. The second contains powers, virtues, and dominions. And the last and the lowest, choirs of the celestial intelligences are called angels, archangels, and principalities. For the 5th or 6th century Neoplatonic Christian theologian, there are nine orders of angels, which are, as he clarifies in other writings, figures of the nine archetypes in God. And for Dionysius, each has a name corresponding to the property in God which it exhibits. Now this is clearly parallel to the Sephirotic system by which the 10 hypostases are clear divine archetypes that exhibit divine properties related to their names. And just for a point of further explanation, some of you may be familiar with this diagram here. Uh, and I, again, I don't want to open a whole new can of worms here. We've already gotten into the philosophical weeds. But for the purpose of displaying divine archetypes, you can see here that we have wisdom and understanding, amongst others, kindness and judgment, beauty and eternity and divine splendor, all of which are divine archetypes according to the Kabbalistic system. Stiles, for his part, goes on in his diary to recount his discussion with the rabbi concerning the Dionysian diagram that he shows him. And he says, I asked him whether there were they were the same as the nine circles upon which Maimonides wrote. These circles denoting angelic orders around the throne, 
or created intelligences. They might be written up and fully described. But the glorious yud heh vav -Hey, the Tetragrammaton, the divine name of God in Hebrew, the four-letter name, enthroned in the central light was mysterious and incomprehensible, and rather to be silently contemplated with humble reverence than to be badly described by a mortal pen. I always think that's an interesting description, badly described by a mortal pen. Whether this was the reason that Maimonides was deterred from writing on the 10th, he's asking him. And then he says, he doubted Dionysius's names of the orders. He supposed the denoted circles of beings and the incomprehensibility of the 10th deterred Rabbi Moses. So in his conversation with the rabbi, Stiles is using what Kabbalah scholar Yossi Chayus, who's borrowing from Christoph Luthi, calls an epistemic image. An epistemic image. By this, Chayus means a depiction, a picture created specifically to replace or to accompany linguistic explanations kind of the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words, or where a something is beyond all language, beyond all words, beyond all speech, perhaps an image can help to uh, clarify such abstract concepts. Um, so here, right, the idea is that a simple diagram allows styles to dialogue concerning abstract concepts, as I was mentioning. And relatedly, it allows him and the rabbi to perceive the imperceptible, turning the traditionally perceived notion, at least traditionally perceived, it's questionable and debatable, uh, of a favored verbal over visual revelation in Judaism on its head, right? There's this idea that Judaism is not a visual religion, it's a more verbal religion, but here we have the visual taking place in this interfaith dialogue. Well, silent contemplation is better than, like I said, better than bad description by a mortal pen, um, Dionysius, this Dionysian inflected apophatism, or that which cannot be said about the divine because it's beyond all saying, it's beyond all speech, it could still be discussed and it could still be compared to its Maimonidean form through the medium of this epistemic image, of this image that can help with understanding. Stiles had received a copy of the works of Pseudo-Dionysius, I should mention, from London in April of 1772. And in a rather unusual turn for a Protestant divine, Dionysius would eventually become one of his favorite authors. In fact, in a letter of 1775 to the famed English astronomer Thomas Wright, Stiles would state, in, and this is in the context of Trinitarian, Trinitarianism as found within the Zohar, he writes, and I'm quoting him here, I am inclined to think the words of Dionysius the Areopagite far more genuine than seems to be allowed by the Protestant learned. He states it explicitly. And he seems to be responding here to Martin Luther's famed denunciation of, I'm quoting, that Dionysius, whoever he was, who Platonizes more than he Christianizes. And also John Calvin condemns Dionysius. He talks about his monkish trifles and his wicked speculations. Styles, as we can see here, as is apparent from the discourse of today, had a rather opposite approach, which involved a more perennialist type of appreciation that crosses otherwise strict religious boundaries. And that leads him to state on November 23rd, 1772, and I'm quoting him here, you can see the quote up on the screen, Rabbi Moses spent the rest of the afternoon in my study explaining the Zohar to me. And then he continues. This forlorn, and this, this is a direct continuation. After he talks about studying the Zohar, he says, 
This formorn I spent reading Dionysius the Areopagite, whom I find to have the same sublime mysteries as the Zohar. The thought of Dionysius the Areopagite gives Styles a point of entry to deeper discussions with the rabbi, and it allows him to put myst a mystical form of Christian angelology, as we saw, into dialogue with Jewish mysticism, and specifically this idea of the sifirot, or these divine hypostases that are divine archetypes. From the side of the rabbi, Maimonidean apophatism in relation to the unmoved mover ultimately leads Maimonides himself and Zoharic Kabbalah as understood through a Maimonidean lens to come into contact with and into dialogue with Dionysian, a Dionysian reading. So this rather ecumenical and I would say interfaith picture comes full circle, so to speak. Bad pun intended because of all of the circles we've been seeing today. So it comes full, to cir full circle in this dialogue between rabbi, the rabbi from Apta and the colonial congregational minister. And this was perhaps the earliest dialogue of its kind upon the North American continent. Now, as a final caveat, I return to the portrait of Styles again, hanging in the Yale University Art Gallery, which with which we began. It's a famous portrait here of one in, one of our founding intellectuals. Uh, and interestingly, if we zoom in on the bookshelf behind Styles' left shoulder, you can see there's a bookshelf here behind his left shoulder. We can see on the bottom shelf a book with Hebrew titles. Get it here. We zoom in. And it says here, Talmud Bet, Ibn Ezra, and Rashi. So this is ostensibly a book of Talmudic writings uh, and important medieval commentators, Ibn Ezra and Rashi, that Stiles purportedly had in his personal library. And then what's interesting is very faintly, if you look at the bottom here on the lower, a little bit lower on the same spine, on the same book, we can see written in Arabic lettering. And I uh, had a colleague, I don't read Arabic, but I had a colleague check this for me. And indeed, it says here, Moshe ibn Maimun, Moreh Nevuchim. That is Moses's, uh, Moses Maimonides. Right, Moses ben Maimon, Maimonides, the guide of the perplexed, this book that we've been talking a little bit about. So Stiles seemingly had direct access to the philosophical text standing behind Rabbi Moshe Bar David's Aristotelian cosmological explanation of the divine Sefirot. If we zoom back out, we can see behind Stiles' right shoulder here, and which is elevated in the upper corner, is a diagram not unlike the one we saw of the pseudo-Dionysian hierarchy. We can zoom in on that here. See, it's in this upper corner, and then we zoom in. And on that, we can see here the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God the Hebrew name, standing in a luminous center that seems to be radiating from itself. And it's surrounded here. You can faintly perhaps see in this image that we have, it says, all happy in God in English. Now, this painting was done in 1771, prior to Stiles' meeting with Moshe Bar David. And it thus shows that Stiles had access to the tools for engaging in real dialogue with the rabbi through his learning. And through his learning of both Maimonides and also through this epistemic image. Um, and he loved these, this idea of these images very much long before his encounter with the rabbi and long before he showed him this diagram of Dionysius. 
In fact, in contemplating this portrait of 1771, Stiles is said to have pronounced, and I'm quoting, these emblems, these types of images, are more descriptive of my mind than the effigies of my face. Fortunately, his diary, and, and specifically his entry uh, concerning his exchange with Rabbi Moshe Bar David, further explain this image and the images of his mind, these emblems of his mind, as he calls them. Um, and they also explain his uses of them in learned dialogue. This offers a picture of one of the intellectual giants who was integral in the founding and direction of some of our major institutions, again, just to recap, such as Yale and Brown University. And it also offers an understudied glimpse into an early endeavor and a paradigmatic precedent of interfaith dialogue through a common philosophical language and through, again, what I'm calling comparative mysticisms. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh I hope you can hear me and everybody else can hear me too. We've had a bit of an issue with uh, Q&A until now, and uh, uh, we will try to uh, attend the best we can to the questions that will show up. Maybe I can start off with a question and then I'll monitor the rest that are coming. Uh, Professor Rogan, could you say a word about Ezra Stiles' interest in things Jewish? How does that come about? Is that unusual for that period of time in the United States? We have heard about Christian Hebraists in Europe, but what about him here? Right. So it's very interesting. It's not completely unusual, although the extent that he takes it to is very particular and unusual. There are others, as I write in my book, who... Um, follow a similar trajectory of a, an understanding of Jewish mysticism. So when we're talking, first of all, on the in terms of the American context, specifically, um, we do have people coming out of the Quaker faith who are very interested and very invested, specifically a person named George Keith, um, who develops an idea of, he's not alone, but he develops an idea of the inner light and the outer light, the inner Christ and the outer Christ. And he's very explicitly taking a lot from the Kabbalistic tradition as he's doing this. He had learned in England uh, with a circle of philosophers named Anne Conway uh, and various Christian Kabbalists there. And then he makes his way to the North American continent and he's establishing Quaker elements that have Kabbalistic inflection. Uh, beyond that, there are some Puritan divines, the Mather, the famed Mathers, both Increase Mather and Cotton Mather. Uh, they engage with Kabbalistic speculation and specifically with Kabbalistic um, interpretations of the Bible in one case, and then also certain messianic strands that um, sort of form almost for increased matter, I claim, almost a form of uh, proto-Christian Zionism in some sense, which is very interesting. Um, beyond that, what what stroke what what strikes styles as what what sort of is a catalyst for Stiles is he's reading the discourses of a figure named Yehuda Monis, who is the first full-time Hebrew instructor at Harvard University. He's a very interesting figure as well, who uh, was originally Jewish. He seems to have been coming from Livorno in Italy. He makes his way to New York and then eventually to the Boston area. And he's converted from Judaism to Congregational Christianity by Increase Mather himself, um, or Increase Mather at least plays a big part of this. He goes on to become a the first full-time Hebrew instructor at Harvard University. Um, and he, this figure, Yehuda Monis, upon his baptism 
and his conversion to Christianity, he gives a bunch of discourses that then later get published, and they're full of Kabbalistic lore. And they quote the Zohar, for example, on the Trinity. And he's making a claim, look here, uh, Jewish mysticism itself talks about the Trinity. Um, Stiles is reading these discourses. He claims that he had met Yehuda Monas at one point, although we have no record of that meeting. But he's reading these discourses, and this is what gets him interested in, oh, there's this entire Jewish tradition that I can read through and that I can come to a better understanding, perhaps, of Christianity, or at least Christianity the way it's supposed to be, in his opinion. So I don't know if that gives an answer. The, the question about on the European continent, certainly there's an interest in something called something that develops that comes to be called um, Christian Kabbalah, or my colleagues now, some of my colleagues prefer to use the term Kabbalistic Christianity, where they're doing precisely these types of things. They're using Kabbalistic hermeneutics. And they're also using Kabbalistic texts in order to try to give a Christian, almost typological reading. And this, this already develops in Italy in the 15th, 16th century, and then onwards and in through into Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, a more technical question. Um, to go back to the philosophical linga, is the emanative process of creation a teleological act in the Kabbalistic cosmological narrative? And how is it different from the Neoplatonic conception of emanation that seems not to be a willful act? And the overcoming of the many back into the unity of the one also seems to imply rather crudely that creation is pointless. Yeah, so there's... Uh, that's a really interesting question, and it's not clear, I would say. There are competing Kabbalistic claims. Um, it really, there does seem to be something teleological to it. There's an idea that things are going to happen the way they're going to happen, and it's, there, it's a sort of process, a deterministic process that's already been set in place. Um, However, kind of like everything with uh, in Jewish thought, there's this I, there's a big caveat that you know the Messiah is gonna come. However, we can hasten that or delay it in some way. Um, it's kind of this a similar process, and there's a debate about how much this type of idea impinges upon free will, for example. Uh, and whether it's on whether it matters and whether it's all pointless in the end. That is, right, if there's this emanatory process and at the end of this process, there's going to be this um, sort of ratzo veshov, this idea of uh, emanating and contracting, this idea of the coming forth and the collapsing together. Uh, and it's just mechanistic in some way, then what does it all matter? And I mean, there are, for this, there are literally thousands upon thousands of pages of uh, debate and speculation. Thank you very much. One more, uh, with thanks for your presentation. The question is, apart from the dialogues and joint learning, uh, how do the rest of Stiles' writings envision Jews and Christians in the divine economy, uh, wondering about supersessionist ideas, for instance? Yeah, that's a really interesting, poignant question. Um, he, again, I don't want to be too acronistic here. He ultimately did have an idea of the conversion of the Jews, However, he is much more mild than some of his uh, contemporaries when it comes to this issue. Um, of course, he would like for a conversion of the Jews. He does, in, he does seem to envision a restored um, place of the Jews in history. Uh, specifically, again, here's almost predecessors to a form of Christian Zionism in the land of Israel itself. 
Um, however, he sees this. So he sees a, on the one hand, he sees a trans, uh, a conversion of the Jews as a people to come to Christ. But at the same time, he also sees a conversion of Christianity to become more of what, again, what I'm calling here apostolic Christianity. He he wants them to be more um, along the lines of the authentic, original group of Christians, which he sees as mostly accessible through these Kabbalistic means, through rabbinic learning, uh, that Christianity itself, as much as Jews need to come to Christ, Christianity needs to come to Judaism. He sees this almost blending, this almost mix that Christianity should get in touch with its roots more in some case. And that's why he implements the learning of Hebrew and the learning of mysticism and even Talmudic exegesis and such. So there's a dual transformation going on here. He also sees, right, that it's a very peculiar idea. Um, in his writings, it's not as well developed as it is, for example, in Increase Mather. But there's an idea that, you know, the eventual return of the Jews as Jews to the Holy Land will eventually take place. Yet they'll ex so so they they are somehow separate in some way in that case, but they'll eventually come to Christ, as it were, um, in their role, uh, and then of course this will bring upon the final eschaton and such, uh, and then I mean they even discuss they're already discussing even wars and they're they're drawing out from the Zohar again this is more increased matter than. Styles, although Styles does touch upon it as well, they're bringing out passages from the Zohar that talk about um, the wars even between um, Ishmael and Israel. And, uh, you know, at their time, he sees it as these wars between the Ottoman Empire um, and ultimately the Jews that, I mean, just to talk about, to bring it even to contemporary events, right, that this war is going to eventually bring upon the final eschaton. So, I mean, we see this already in this early American thought, which is kind of interesting. Thank you very much. I think we will stop with the questions here, but you're invited to send those to me if you would like, and I will forward them to our speaker. But perhaps this is the time to conclude the lecture and the Q&A. And thank you, all of you. First of all, our guest speaker. Thank you, Professor Ogren, for being here with us. Thank you for having me again. Yes. Thank you so much. Now, if you have enjoyed this lecture, uh, I, I encourage you to take a look at Dr. Ogren's books. Uh, for those who are students at TCU and Bry, those are available for us through the library and for all of us, of course, through Amazon and other possible portals. If you enjoyed this lecture, I invite you to consider attending our next Zoom lecture, which will take place on Wednesday, November the 29th, more or less at the same time at 1 p.m. We will hear from Professor Chris Steeman from uh, Walsh University, and he will address the topic of correcting misrepresentations of Jews and Judaism in the classroom, the pulpit, and the public sphere. I would like to close with a word of thanks to Vanessa Bailey and Lauren Baxter, who made this event possible today. And of course, we're grateful for the funds provided by Crystal Endowment, which has supported so many important events here at Bright. Special thanks to all of you, our audience, and we hope to see you all again in November. Thank you.